Hello everyone. Um, this is the first uh, instructional video and I am um, I'm gonna begin by uh, covering some ground that uh, will help build a bridge between where we were before the extended break and where we'll be picking up. So that'll be this first video and I'll cover some ideas that we touched on, some ideas that we could have looked at a little bit more closely, and then some things that might seem distantly familiar, just to bring everybody up to speed. And then I'll stop there, and then I will begin composing something for this week's readings, which involve uh, John Locke, Clifford Connor, and uh, Carl Linnaeus. Connor is a modern writer writing about the scientific revolution, so... Um, that's a bit of context there, but uh, anyways, uh, just very quickly, um, we have talked some about uh, universities and uh, medieval universities in particular, and a little bit about medieval education, uh, but it's important to keep in mind that uh, uh, there was a general sense of a curriculum for uh, college-bound individuals, and it's divided into two parts. The first part is called the trivium. Uh, three individual topics uh, that were uh, considered very basic for one's uh, earlier education. And those included grammar, uh, which is obviously the organization of language, logic, uh, sort of uh, uh, deductive process, um, and then rhetoric, the art of persuasion. And those would be um, topics that uh, younger college-bound students would study. It. And then the quadrivium was uh, four subjects, uh, high, considered higher subject level matter. And though that would be arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. And again, these would be things that uh, one would study in whatever uh, equivalent of university preparation that one uh, would, would be going through. So trivium and quadrivium are two important concepts. Now if you scroll down you'll see I've listed some of the better known medieval universities. These uh, institutions have a pretty obscure history and it's important to keep in mind that um, while they were called universities and uh, young people, pretty much exclusively men, would enroll in universities and would hear lectures and would uh, be asked to take examinations and you know there were the trappings of the medieval university that we would recognize today there they weren't places where practical skills and knowledge were really disseminated uh, they were places where uh, you would go to study to become a minister for example you'd study theology or perhaps some philosophy um, so some of the more famous ones uh, are Oxford and Cambridge, which were actually training grounds for ministers. Um, the uh, Italian uh, College of Salerno, the university at Salerno, was a highly regarded uh, school of medicine, but it was medicine based firmly in natural philosophy, much more so than in practical healing. And that becomes important as we get into the history of medicine um, and the tensions between university trained doctors who were good at debating matters versus actual healers who were taught more by, uh, uh, according to experience and apprenticeships and uh, had much more um, informal healing practices, weren't certified, but were nonetheless considered effective hands-on healers. So um, that's another thing that uh, the uh, reading by Clifford Connor will address. Uh, so more on that in just a bit. Um, the, another famous uh, university in Italy was Bologna, which was a, another place where theology and philosophy were emphasized. Uh, and then you have a couple of um, universities uh, in France. The University of Paris was always and is still considered a, uh, a place of um, uh, great uh, intellectual uh, engagement. Um, the uh, idea of philosophy being a um, uh, you know, the most popular topic there. And in that day, that would be uh, 
mainly Aristotle, but also Plato and some of the um, uh, medieval uh, philosophers whose ideas would be debated there. Uh, and then uh, Montpellier was another um, place where philosophy and theology kind of uh, vied for preeminence. And lastly, the University of uh, Germany, uh, the German University Heidelberg is another commonly uh, identified medieval university. It was founded in the 14th century and a uh, place where natural philosophy was the, the main subject matter. Okay, so uh, those are just some uh, details and uh, you are welcome to pause and Google away and find out more about uh, medieval universities and the trivium and quadrivium as you see fit. Um, I did include this little uh, piece comparing uh, Aristotle's deductive reasoning and Francis Bacon's inductive reasoning. Aristotle, of course, has the top down, the search for general principles and in individual particulars. And Bacon, uh, that contrasts with Bacon's inductive reasoning, which uh, finds uh, facts based on a field of particulars and specific instances. Okay, there are some other characteristics that enable us to contrast Aristotle and Francis Bacon and really to understand how the uh, thinking of Aristotle, which held for almost 2,000 years in terms of its influence, uh, gradually gave way to Bacon's new way of seeing things, uh, which um, uh, is expressed in his ideas of the four idols, which we talked about in class, and the idea of the great instaturation, the restoration, or the, the uh, uh, emergence of a new way of um, understanding how to gain knowledge and how to um, uh, understand the world. Uh, lastly, uh, there's uh, some materials about English history in the Real point to this is to establish the uh, developments that helped establish the formation of the Royal Society. You've got some videos in this week's um, content section that explain how that organization came to develop. So um, the uh, I've used that uh, chart in class or some version of it and. Um, the culmination is the uh, Royal Society, and we've already talked about Newton and Robert Boyle, and there's some other influential thinkers that um, uh, emerged from that period. Uh, and then finally, the scientific revolution, uh, an outgrowth uh, not just of intellectual uh, uh, achievements, but also a need for practical innovations in a number of areas uh, suiting a, both a growing population and more sophisticated forms of government and commerce. And those included matters of um, husbandry or estate management, uh, survey, the need to uh, measure the landscape for mapping purposes, navigation, how to uh, plot a course on a ship through uh, the ocean according to uh, different um, uh, indications, both positioning of stars and landscape features and so forth. Uh, munitions, the development of cannons, uh, medicine, especially obstetrics, uh, the matters of relating to um, healing and giving birth and uh, the, the development of um, techniques that enabled um, doctors and uh, midwives and other healers to understand those matters more fully. Also, architecture and food storage. Um, I see I've gone on longer than I uh, hoped for, but uh, I'm going to stop here. Again, please do uh, take uh, the opportunity to uh, look at some of the resources on the content page and uh, fill yourself in on the uh, context for uh, the readings that uh, uh, we'll be um, uh, looking at this week. So I'll stop here and I will uh, pick up with another video uh, that will focus on this week's readings. Thanks for watching.